but we're also suggesting that we need to reduce the number of cabinet posts. So for instance, we don't need a Ministry of Electricity. The only reason we do is because the ANC doesn't know how to solve the yes. electricity problem. Political parties, the, the, the traditional political parties, believe in taking people out of their homes and of their areas to go and listen to them, the politicians, speak. We've flipped this around. We will come to... Welcome to the State of the Nation, as we keep on working towards giving you more information about your options for our very important 2024 general elections. And before you get to choose who to vote for in the coming general elections in May, we want to help you with your choice of, uh, of rental car company. And today's uh, podcast is sponsored by Pace Car Rental. And the great news is that they will give you a discount if you use the code SONA, State of the Nation, right? And uh, you'll get a discount. So you'll see the details below in the, uh, in the comments. Uh, please give their website a try. They're all around the country and you'll hear more later in this particular episode. But today I'm very excited to announce that we've got one of the people that is really making waves in South African politics. And that is the leader of Rise of Zanzi, Mr. Songezo Zibi. Songezo, welcome back to the State of the Nation. It's great to have you here. Mike, thank you very much for having me in the State of the Nation. I've been yeah. looking forward to it. Yep. And now you're absolutely in the ring. Things are going very, very quickly. We, 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 we bearing down on these elections quite fast. It's been manifesto season. Yep. And uh, Rise of Zanzi have come out with a very easy to read, very easy to understand manifesto. Uh, to those people that are joining us that uh, that are driven by manifestos, which we should do, it is uh, it is the plan. If you do vote for the for the party, and that would be their plan that most aligns with you, you've put it uh, put five key areas, five mm. key issues that you're dealing with. Um, I don't know. Some people call them pillars and themes. points and themes, and priority yours are themes. Th priority themes, yeah. Priority themes. So let's go through them. Yes. Because I think that they make for some very interesting uh, ideas and, uh, and more exciting way of looking at, at the future of the country. You speak about leadership and governance yes. implementation. Yes. Tell us about that. So, you know, when we have political conversation, typically, we always ask what's different between you and another party, between RISE and the DA, your RISE and the ANC and so on. But I think our big elephant in the room here is the ANC. They run eight of the nine provinces. They run the national government. They control parliament. They appoint the senior officials all the way to chapter nine institutions. So they really are responsible for the state of the country as it is. And therefore, we need to use them as the yardstick of why things are not happening the way they should. And our conclusion at Rising Sons is that they do not have the leadership and the technical capacity anymore because they, they have now become a, a racketeering operation that focuses on corruption. They're not appointing the right people to the right roles. And even when decisions are very simple, they take a long time. And I'll give you one example. It took Pravin Gordon how long in cabinet to appoint a chief executive at ESCO and at Transnet. And Transnet didn't have a finance director either in almost a year. ESCOM in a year, no chief executive. The FD was acting as a chief executive, which also meant you have an acting FD. That's not a policy problem, Mike. Yeah. It's a leadership problem. Yeah. When you have municipalities that can't put financial statements together, that's not a policy problem. It's a leadership problem. So we've come to that conclusion. That's why our election slogan is we need new leaders. Yes. Because unless you solve the thinking, you solve the work ethic, you solve the integrity and the talent, no smart policy is ever going to work. And, and sticking with your, with your first theme, uh, the, the one that jumped out at me is uh, streamlining. Yes. Right, which, uh, which I don't think there's anybody out there that uh, follows South African politics that can't look at what we have at the moment and say... Good heavens, this needs some streamlining. We've got uh, about 67 cabinet posts and everyone's got uh, at least one deputy and so on and so forth. We are sitting with bloated cabinets. 
which has led to uh, uh, its problems of its own. Mm. Uh, what is your uh, approach going to be towards cabinet positions or cabinet? Yeah, cab not positions, but cabinets. Uh, um, you know, portfolios. Is the word. So, so our philosophy is that you you really need to 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 culture cultivate a culture where the ministers are almost as good if not as good as the technocrats <laughs> right they've got a, a political mandate they've got a policy making role they've got a legislative origination role so they need to be very well versed in those portfolios so that's important but we also suggesting that we need to reduce the number of cabinet posts. So, for instance, we don't need a Ministry of Electricity. The only reason we do is because the ANC doesn't know how to solve the electricity problem. They don't know how to solve the unemployment problem. So we now have a Department of Labor and Employment, but there's still high unemployment and so on. So get rid of gimmicks like that. Do a couple of things, Mike. First, give the responsibility in terms of our constitution for economic planning and development to the Treasury. That's what the Constitution says. Give it to give it, give it to that de department. Another example is you don't need a Department of Trade and Industry and a Department of Small Business. No, you can have a Department of Business, mm. right? That deals with small and large businesses, has policies that enable and empower them to do what they to do what they they, they need to be doing in order to grow the South African economy. And you take macroeconomic policy planning and industrialization and those kind of things put them in the in the in, in, in the department of finance in, in the treasury and then you take the international trade portfolio you can put it together with uh, foreign relations for instance foreign affairs because why else do you have foreign affairs other than to expand trade and to advance human rights and build cultural friendships you can do these things together that's what australia does hmm. Some simple examples, Mike, yeah. such as that, yeah. that and would help you streamline your, 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 the way your government operates. And of course, uh, I mean, you, you mentioned my favorite bugbear, and that is we've got this Department of Trade and Industry, and then almost as a joke, <laughs> starting off with Alec Irwin, it seems like we've always put the person in that position as Minister of Trade and Industry that hated trade and industry. Yes, yeah, he put a communist so he put there. put the, the most devout leather yeah, yeah. patch wearing... Uh, <laughs> yes. um, Right, because we had Rob Davies and following Alec Irwin, and now you've got Ibrahim Patel, and all of them absolutely hate yeah. the private sector, and yet they're in charge of, of trade and industry. At best, they're suspicious. Yeah. At well, best. I think you're being way too kind. Um, the, moving on to the, your next theme is you talk about, you've got a very nice way of putting keep, keeping people safe. Yes. Right, because, you know, we did a piece here the other day, uh, it's very interesting that South Africa took Israel to the International Court of Justice and when they actually began the case, 13,000 Palestinians have been killed. Mm. Around 30,000, 30,000 South Africans will be murdered this year. Mm. And, uh, you know, perhaps we should take ourselves to the International uh, Court of Justice. But tell us about your plans to make South Africa a safer place, especially for women. So firstly, Mike, you know, we believe that we should just reorientate how we think about safety. We should understand the drivers and we must try and solve both the drivers of, uh, of unsafety in communities and families, but also a, a sort of respond to the patterns that we see in society. And I'll make just a couple of examples. So in many communities which are underserviced, do you know what people ask for in order to even feel safer and for there to be less crime? Lights. Mm. You know, if you're in an informal settlement, it's pitch black at night. Anything can happen, right? These are communities where there is no lighting, even those shared communal lights that you have in some communities. It's just, just a simple example. The second thing that we're saying is that we need to expand the meaning of safety. Mike, how many people die on the roads in South Africa? Right, over 24,000. That's a staggering number. That's like 2,000 mm. people per month. We had a bus crash a few days ago, tragically. The, the pilgrims from Botswana going to Moria. It made world headlines. But 2,000 people that die in, in road accidents, uh, you know, in South Africa and various ways die or get injured is not a big story. So we take a holistic approach to safety. And we say people should be safe wherever they are. So that means it is safety on the road, it is safety in the community, it is safety at home. At home, 
typically it's men who abuse women. You can't put a cop in every home. So there's a whole conversation that we've started around GBV and getting men to behave differently, to take greater responsibility in the community and so on. There is investing in community safety infrastructure with citizen participation in order to make communities safe. Then there is investment in proper policing, intelligence gathering, pre crime prevention, and then successful investigation and prosecution, which means training police officers, training prosecutors, so that you can have better outcomes in the courts and the, the whole range of other issues. So it's very holistic, Mike. Okay. And, and you know, much of what we, uh, what, what sort of drives many of the problems that we have on, in South Africa is our economy. Yeah. Your third theme is around the economy and job prosperity. Yes. Um, what would a rise government do that would boost this economy? So several things. First of all, return confidence back to, to the economy, right? There are three major issues with the South African economy. The first is the availability and cost of electricity, right? Which means ESCOM. The second is the country's logistics infrastructure, which means Transnet. You solve these two, Mike, you've got 3% GDP growth already. We we should make it 4% if you add the the weak 1% that we have now already. That already has a big impact on, uh, on, on potential job creation. Then you solve safety. If people are afraid of crime, they can't open a spaza shop, Mike. They can't do anything, have a side hustle at home, have a cash business. Because in places like Mtata, where I'm from, the violent crime is so bad. You talk about foreign investment. The local people can't invest in the local economy in order to create jobs. So safety is a major aspect. But linked to that is the uh, ability of people to get employment, right? And that means together with this, we need to do skills training as well. Because 90% of South Africa's unemployed people simply don't have a skill. 90%. That's unforgivable in a country that is closing hundreds of schools a year. And linked to that, another reason that people wouldn't invest is uh, some of the uh, discussion around uh, property rights. Yes. Which, uh, of course, sends every any international investor running away. Mm. It sends local investors running away. I'm yeah. not going to go and buy a factory if I know that there's a chance somebody's that gonna uh, somebody's going to take it away. Yeah. I, and and like I, I mean, I did have shame. I mean, I've got to say, you might see him in Parliament next year, but Carl Niehaus over here, you know, I said... Uh, if the government owns everything and I do get, uh, because they like me, they give me some big factory, there's not a hope in hell I'm going to be improving that while there's no property rights, right? If it belongs to somebody else, yeah. I'm going to run it into the ground. It's the, everybody does it. You know, it's that old thing that the best uh, off-road vehicle is usually a, a rental car. Sorry, pace car rental, but believe me, <laughs> people drive car rental cars a little differently to their own cars. It's it's that principle, isn't it? No, it, this is really important, Mike. You know, I'll give you an example, uh, which is my family and the families around uh, my village, uh, in my in my community, have been subsistence farmers for for a very long time, for decades uh, since that village was uh, was was formed in the 1930s and 1940s. And the land, you know, land is spiritual for people, for rural, people in rural communities in particular. We bury our dead on the property. There are some political parties that say all of that land must belong to the state. Now, you know, I think that's going to be very difficult. South Africans can be trusted with land. They can be trusted with property. What we need is well thought out government policy and government investment that enables people to use the assets they own in order to produce really good outcomes for the economy. And because there are people who believe that if the government doesn't own it, then it doesn't work for everybody. We should trust South Africans to use the assets they have at their disposal, and we must enable them to acquire more assets so that they can use them productively productively for their own benefit and for the benefit of the people around them and their community. I don't know what's so difficult to understand about that. So I agree with you, Mike, that that's one of the most basic tenets. Otherwise, we can't put money into that land 
and plant maize and all of the things that we plant in that land if in the middle of the season the government can come and take it yeah uh, you were talking about uh, moving to healthcare well-being you call it uh, individual and family well-being yes uh, now Rizam Zanzi has definitely created a niche for themselves and I've spoken to most of the parties and that is around health and well-being yes. not not just health like as in hospitals but well-being as well-being in, in general yes. in general tell us about your plans there so mike let me first say where it came from mm-hmm. you know we we you know, when we have our meetings we do little talking and we ask the people present in the community to ima- to imagine the kind of community that they would want to live in if they were to be given an opportunity to be a cabinet what would be the most important thing that they would wish everybody has and they always say well being we want to be healthy mentally we want to be healthy physically we want to be safe i want my kids to be safe my mom to be safe my dad to be safe and for everybody in south africa to be happy which by the way links to the idea of non racialism believe it or not because south africans tell us that we just want everybody to be happy to get along mm. and then they mention a couple of things mike which we have now adopted they say we think the ability to secure or produce food for yourself is really important we want a government that's going to help us with that but we want to be self sufficient as far as food is concerned we want to be near a health facility for 90% of our needs about 15 20 minutes ride to to get there to a health facility people say we want arts and culture and sporting facilities so that the whole community can get together we can cheer each other's kids get along talk about other issues and we might start tackling some of the issues that we have in the in the community we've adopted that into our then they talk about drugs the drugs pandemic in south africa that is affecting young people they say if we had one or two rehab centers in every district especially in the rural areas and then all of these facilities that we're talking about we would all be healthier and happier and safer and that sort of thing so we've simply plagiarized what people have told us they want yeah. and we put it in our manifesto and it has become a differentiating issue but it enables you to have 8 to 10 policy proposals within that one theme that would create the kind of communities that South Africans deserve to live in Well, I don't think any I can't believe that you would get any argument about that. Just while we're still on the subject of well-being, where do you stand on the cu- current argument around um discussion around the national health insurance? National health insurance. Look, we believe that every South African should get access to specialized care when they need it. And let me give you an example. So my cousin is a urologist in the Eastern Cape. He is one of I think five in the <laughs> province. Okay. The need is greater. People with kidney and related problems are many in the province, right? They often do not have basic uh, facilities that they need in the hospitals and so on to start treating some of the patients and they have to wait because of supply issues, lack of money and and so on, right? South Africans deserve those services. But that's not an insurance problem. Yeah. It's a health infrastructure problem. it's a health department resourcing problem the reason we say every south african should have access within 15 minutes ride of a public health facility that is well equipped medical staff are well trained good working conditions decent pay is because we understand that even as you need to find a solution for specialized care which might be solved by an nhi type of solution The reality is that we don't have enough assets, not good enough leadership and management, and not good enough uh, infrastructure in within uh, communities. That will obviate the need to even go to a private healthcare facility. Mm. 99% of South Africans should be going to a decent public health facility which is funded by taxpayers and you only need your medical aid only for specific chronic illnesses that might need you to top up you know what yeah. i mean because the amount of money south africans spend on medical aid already yeah. is exorbitant mike that should go towards retirement mm. that should go towards educating children yeah. and so and we're making south africans poorer 
with these things that we've become addicted to, like public school, uh, private schools, private mm. medical care, and that sort of thing. Well, yeah, we uh, it, it is an enormous burden on on South Africa because we do have a national health system, don't we? We've got public facilities that uh, should be run properly and it could do the bulk of the heavy lifting and improved upon. And, and in fact, Mike, um, and, and the improvements can be made. I mean, the Department of Health in the Eastern Cape is beginning this financial year that began yesterday with a 4.6 billion rand deficit because of money that is owed to suppliers, medical legal claims, and that sort of thing, right? And if we can't solve those kind of problems, Mike, where the money is managed properly, the supply chain is managed properly, you've got properly trained doctors with good working conditions and so on to reduce the medical legal claims. Simply instituting a national health insurance doesn't take that problem away. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. We still need to get the basics right, which takes us to our first theme, which is leadership, leadership. and implementation. Yeah, otherwise the NHI starts looking like purely a thing to get rid of private health care as opposed to doing anything about public health care. I don't even think they're trying to get rid of, pri of, 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 uh, of private health care, but they, they just want to look like they're doing something. Yes. It's like the 35 age group thing that, yes. uh, that they've instituted in the expanded public works program. They want to look like they're doing something, but they're just shifting unemployment around the different age groups. Yeah, and uh, just for those people that don't know, Sungezo was explaining that in the expanded public works program, there's an age cap of 35. 35, yeah. And that was as a response to people complaining about youth unemployment. And now all you've got is just older older people, not old people, people above the age of 35 that can't be part yeah. of that expanded works program, which could be even more catastrophic because those people might have children at home, etc. whereas uh, the 20-year-old, is just going to go and have, uh, you know, he's, he doesn't have the same sort of financial obligations. Yeah. Your fifth theme is very interesting, I found, because uh, not too many of the political parties have made um, as bold a uh, thing as to have a, a real sort of one of their main themes being the climate crisis. Yes. And it's a crisis, Mike. Yes. We, we need to call it that. And, and I will use just two examples that South Africans will be very familiar with. If you live in KZN, your household insurance costs have possibly gone up if you are insured. If you're not insured, you have had to rehabilitate your home numerous times because of flooding. In some instances, people have lost their homes entirely. In informal settlements, entire homes have been swept aside. That's a crisis, and it's caused by climate change. The second example I will make, Mike, is my village. Uh, the yield this year is likely to be zero in 2024 for maize because it rains at the wrong time, it rains too much, then it becomes too hot for too many weeks, and the seeds and everything that people use uh, in order to plant maize are, you know, they outdated, they're not resilient and that sort of thing. So we've decided to place this right at the center of South African politics, to say the toll on South Africans, the toll on businesses, the toll on employment, the toll on food security and so on, is such that it can't be a side issue anymore. We need to respond properly. Every government, municipal and provincial plan needs to have climate mitigation and the use of renewable energy and so on right at the center of what they're doing. Otherwise, we're facing a catastrophe soon. Okay. So... Which sort of leads us elegantly into one of uh, the problems that you've mentioned earlier on when we are talking about the economy is electricity, which yes. um, when you become president on uh, the, on the, 30th, first, of the 30th of May, 1st of June, first of June eh? uh, you're going to be stuck with an electricity crisis. Yes. How would you deal with it? What would be your, 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 your short-term, medium-term, long-term plan on, 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 electric, on the electricity crisis? So I think it's important to establish some principles, Mike. And, and I know that people from various special interests tend to take extreme views. There are some people who believe that just move into renewables immediately and mm. you'll solve the problem. Mm. There are people who say, no, 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 just renewables. We've got lots of coal in South Africa. Just go with coal and everything will be fine. The truth is that both of these sides are lying. Mm. <laughs> Things are not that simple, right? We believe that we should have a well-orchestrated and well-paced transition from fossil fuels into renewables because you need to have a base load 
as all experts will tell you, our base base flows is largely dependent on coal. We are going to continue being dependent on coal for some time, but we should seek to reduce that dependence as fast as possible. That is the first thing. So that we can move on to renewables. But going together with that, our distribution net network was built around the coal fields. We need about half a trillion rand or more to invest in transporting the energy from renewable energy sources like the Northwest, like the Northern Cape and that sort of thing, which are in different parts of the country, into businesses and households and cities and that sort of thing. The third thing I'm going to say lastly, because I've got too many things, just that <laughs> one last one, Mike, that is, let's turn this crisis into an opportunity. Mike, I would go back to those Western countries and say, guys, can we have two and a half of that six and a half billion dollars in concessional loans and so on as a grant to put solar panels on every roof in South Africa. We are going to train young people who are currently unemployed to install that solar and to maintain those solar those, those solar systems. They can start their businesses and be on the way to being capable service pro providers in other parts of the economy. I would go to China and I would go to Germany, the two leading countries in the production of solar energy technology, and say, guys, partner with us to use some of these grants that we've got from you guys because you've got money so that we can build two, three solar panel factories in South Africa. That's how you turn a crisis into an opportunity, uh, Mike. But we don't have imaginative uh, politicians. They're busy squabbling about where the money is coming from and who's going to eat it. Mm. Another thing that they keep on debating is, uh, is immigration. Yeah. And it is. Uh, there are some parties that have made it the lodestar of their of their um, campaign. Is yeah. all about in doing various things to immigrants. Some uh, um, want to lock them away, send them back. We've got the Patriotic Alliance, Action SA, very hard on immigration. You've got the EFF wanting to drop down the borders. Where does Razum Zanzi stand? Mike, there is no need to drop down the borders, but there's also no need to demonize I I immigrants either. Uh, we just need to solve the problem, mm. which again takes us to leadership and, and, yeah. and governance, right? We have a broken immigration system. Uh, the, our borders are porous, first of all. Uh, any and anyone can come in with uh, just a little bit of creativity you're in and you can stay as long as you want. Uh, that's a problem. No country operates like that. So we must fix the security of the border system so that everybody who comes here hands in their passport to the border gate, they state a reason, their passport is stamped, their address is known where they're going to live, and, and, and. Whoever is looking for a work permit must apply for it, and if they qualify, they get a job. If they can't get a work permit, then well, they can't get a work permit. I also can't just go and live in France. Uh, so what I'm saying, Mike, is let us just apply the law but that means, again, different leadership, secure the borders. But there's a question of what we do with people that are already in South Africa. And we need a tough but humane policy. What do I mean by that? What we mean by that is that we need to make sure that everybody who's undocumented who is in South Africa is documented. They need to apply for the right status that they qualify for. If it's a work permit, you apply for it. If it's refugee status and asylum, you apply for it and so on. Right? If you don't qualify, the government needs to look at your circumstances. If, for instance, you've been here 15 years, you've got children, they are South African, they don't know the country from which you came, we must think about ways of regularizing you so that you can become a citizen. If you've committed a crime or you are here for a suspicious reason, out. <laughs> right? You need to go back. I mean, they do this in other countries yes. too. So we need a well calibrated, thoughtful, immigration reform in South Africa. That is not going to dehumanize people. And I would implore the leaders of other political parties not to inflame passions in communities because they don't want to come up with systemic solutions to a complex problem. Yeah. Uh, your number one theme is starting to become more and more important, this thing about leadership and governance. Let's turn our attention to uh, to politics. Yes. The manifesto... Uh, I certainly struggle to find fault with uh, with the manifesto, oh, and uh, and you can see it's a result of a lot of good thinking and very careful uh, communication. Uh, politics sometimes isn't like that, right? Mm. We we had we knew I, I, I sort of made a 
the comment that we knew we were, the, we were in election season when uh, I think it was the president accused you of being uh, uh, paid for by the CIA who wanted regime change because he saw your poster before he saw anybody else's. You have run uh, quite an efficient campaign. You are one of the first, uh, certainly in the metropolitan areas. I can't talk for, for some of the other areas. You've been quite um, visible, Rise and Zanzi. Mm. And uh, you've been on the tip of everybody's tongues. But then the one part that doesn't play the game are the pollsters. Yeah. Which seemingly, this is not just a Rise and Zanzi issue. There's a similar issue with Build One South Africa, a similar issue with even Action SA. Mm where it seems like uh, the pollsters only talk about three parties with maybe three more that they, and they're the parties mm. that have stood before. Mm. Where do you put yourselves in this whole uh, scenario in, in, in South Africa? What is, what is a reasonable expectation for RISE? Look, uh, polls are not predictive. Mm. They are instructive. It's a snapshot in time. <laughs> right at a particular point in time. And I will use, I think, the, the most talked about poll has been the Brand Test Foundation poll, mm -hmm. which put us at around 0.2% in October last year. It's now put us at 1% with a 3% margin of error, which means... It means you could get minus 2%. No, no, no. <laughs> Remember... What, what the trend that it's showing is that our trend is positive, unlike one of the yeah, political yeah. parties that you mentioned where the trend is regressive, yeah. right? That the trend is positive, mm. right? That's a good thing for us. It also says we are between 1% and 4%, which is 16 seats already, right? Uh, and so we are heartened by the trend that that poll is showing, considering that we're not even a year old. Mm. Uh, Mike, we turned one year old on the 19th mm. uh, of April this year because we made the announcement on the 19th of April uh, last year. So the polls have been showing a very positive trend. But I want to talk about the posters because in order to be considered by voters, they need to know you exist. So the most cost-effective way of letting voters know that you exist is poster. We're not a big party. We can't rent big billboards on the N1. You've seen the DA and other political mm. parties doing that. They are better established and better resourced. The most effective thing is posters because even individual donors uh, donate 100 posters, 500 posters, 1,000 posters. Some people say, okay, I'll pay for my suburb. I'll pay for my area or oh, just this street that I live on and that kind of thing. It all counts. And everybody is amazed at how we've got these posters. But the postering is the outcome also of having a really excellent campaign management team. We went out and we got the professionals who've done it before in South Africa a, for parties that were small a, at one stage like ourselves. And that experience is beginning to come through. That, that's why people are talking about us. You've also done um, an enormous amount of work on the ground. Yes. Uh, which, you know, I was uh, speaking to somebody last week and they were saying that uh, that's been the, the, the difference in that so many of these new parties haven't just come along with one perhaps well-known person at the top expecting people to now suddenly vote for them even though they didn't even have a, a manifesto or anything you guys have actually put people on the ground you've you've gone out there you've yeah. you've you've spoken to a lot of people where about would you say is the strength of rise and Zanzi geographically in south africa so geographically i mean the the biggest by far has been Gauteng. i mean it's 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 stand out by multiples, our biggest in terms of just the support. You know, when we launched our manifesto in uh, in, in January, we had four thousand people there. We knew each of those people by name because they were our registered sub, uh, supporters already. We knew where they from. We knew where to send the buses, and we knew we were to take them back in the afternoon. All of them are from Gauteng. There were some people who travelled on their own from other provinces, but the people that we brought into that hall. And there were 4,000 of them came from Gauteng. The reason we do the door-to-door -door and the street meetings and the meetings under trees and so on is that political parties, the, the traditional political parties, believe 
in taking people out of their homes and of their areas to go and listen to them, the politicians speak. We've flipped this around. We will come to you. You host us where it is most convenient for you. So we've got lots of house meetings as well. Host us where it is most convenient for you. And we want you to do most of the talking. And tell us what we must go and fight for when we get to parliament. That's one of the things people don't understand. They will talk about money and all of these things. Mike, there is no substitute for talking to people who are cynical and don't trust politicians. People can't trust you if they haven't seen your organizers in the face and whether they can trust them or not. Yeah. And another uh, way to achieve that is um, is that you're not going to do it by yourself when it's a Songhezo ZB party Yeah. and you have to be at every meeting and make every decision. You definitely have put together quite an impressive team, haven't you? Yeah, Mike, I must say that's one thing I'm grateful for. And we got a lot of pressure. I mean, if we had gone and recruited some celebrity politicians from the ANC, we would probably have an extra 100 million in our coffers to do this election campaign. The problem is people are tired of these people. Yes, They want to see people that have got a track record in other areas other than politics. Mm. So, for instance, we've got Vuiswa Ramukhop. Vuiswa is a business person. She's been on stage with the nation. She's been a business person. She's been a a leader in business associations. She's an entrepreneur. She's a mother. And so that's one example. We've got Akloli Lenokyuala, who has been a social and community justice activist in Cape Town all of his working life in the city of Cape Town is our premier candidate in the in the in the in the Western Cape. We've got Nongululego Shongwanem Shongo in KZN. If you want to meet somebody who deeply cares about democratic participation and democratic accountability, that is Nongululego. She has worked in that space for a long time. She understands communities, civil society, the democracy deficit and how to fix it. So we've got a wide range of people and people like uh, Professor Nick Benadel, who yes. founded Gibbs. Yes. So we've got this kind of mix of people, young and old, yes. who are highly capable. Now, I didn't, uh, we, we spoke about your, your, your launch or the strength being in Gauteng. Mm. And, uh, and then I got carried away talking about some of your yes. management team. But there's, there's other areas oh, which yes. you now find yourself quite ably represented. And you mentioned, you know, representation in KZN, the Western, Western Cape. Cape. Yeah. Uh, I presume the Eastern Cape through the East, yourself. The, the Eastern Cape. And you know what's really also going to surprise us is the Free State and the Northwest. I mean, I, I was there recently. And I was completely blown away the, by the, the positive response, by the way, way people were fanatical about RISE and our idea and the inclusivity of the organization. And, uh, and, and so I think that in most of the provinces, we could to produce a very decent tenor. We are very realistic, Mike. We're not going to defeat the ANC in this election. But by 2026... South Africans will sit up and take proper notice. By 2029, we'll be in the government. Yeah. Well, look, I, I would definitely uh, say that uh, regardless of where we stand, uh, there's going to be a few surprises come the end of, uh, of this. Before we uh, close off, I just want to talk about, uh, you know, we've, we've obviously seen some seismic shifts mm. in, the, in South African political landscape. Yes. Um, we saw... Um, ex-president Jacob Zuma come out of the crypt, uh, backing the MK party. What do you make of that whole situation? There are people who were eating and getting fat in Jacob Zuma's time. They are now excluded from the people that are eating and getting fat out of Cyril, uh, Cyril's uh, false new dawn. And the two factions of corruption are unhappy with one another. So Jacob Zuma has done the equivalent of taking his ball and charging out and setting up his own playing field so that he can build the leverage to eat again and to protect himself from corruption charges. That's what's going on. The unfortunate thing is that there are still lots of people that are misled by such opportunists. And 
And the opportunities are not just in MK. The opportunities are in the ANC. The opportunities are in other political organizations because they can leverage the historical credibility some of these figures have. But our message as Rise Mzansi is, by any other name or color, the ANC is still the ANC. Whether people are in the ANC or in other political parties, they were together in 2007 in Bulugwan when they took some irrational decisions to advance corruption ahead of the interests of the South African people. We know them. The South Africans will not be fooled. And soon enough, the majority of South Africans will see them for what they really are. Now, obviously, um, as I when I recently interviewed uh, JJ Tabani and I said, what do you think of coalitions? He said to me a very probably the best answer in coalitions. He said, it doesn't matter what I think we're going to have coalitions. Yeah, that's true. Right? It's not like I can choose <laughs> no, to not have 100%, coalitions. It's yeah. going to happen. The ANC looks set to drop below 50%, um, significantly enough to need a few partners, mm. if not one major partner. Where does Rise Mzanzi sit with coalitions? I know that there was talk initially about you slotting neatly into the multi-party charter. Mm. If I'm not mistaken, you said it was premature. Of course. I mean, you, you know, Mike, when somebody invites you into a coalition, you haven't secured the votes, you don't have a manifesto, you haven't held a convention. That sounds like co-option. Because on what basis are we getting into a political relationship? It's just a simple principle that I think anybody with a, a single bone of integrity in their body would say, no, 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 no. we need to wait. So that was very important. The, the second thing is that I think it's important for all of the political parties that are talking about coalitions to recognize that you draw your mandate from voters. Go and secure a mandate, maximize your vote, and then go and negotiate in good faith. So what's our position? Our position is this. If the South African people decide that the ANC is not the majority party anymore, Rise Mzansi will not be their first stop for their resurrection back into the union building. They can forget about it, right? Because we need to make a genuine good faith effort at giving South Africans an alternative government, not this disaster that we've had for the last 15 years. Right? So I think that's, that's really important as a principle. But having said that, Elections are such as they are. Nobody actually knows who's going to get how much percentage and therefore how the coalitions form. The only thing that we ask for is that we do this in good faith. When we enter into a coalition, we stick to the agreement for the five years because it will be damaging for South Africans to have a new finance minister every year, such as we see in the city of Joburg, in the city of Tswan, and that kind of thing. That will destroy South Africa. It's important that we are all grown up and we intend to be grown up. And the final thing I want to say is we actually don't mind doing the work of parliament. It's very important. Oversight is important interrogating the ministers, even if they are from a coalition government, is important. There is this obsession with ministerial positions in South Africa that is unhealthy and leads to the collapse of these coalitions. So we keep an open mind. We're going to do this in good faith in the interest of South Africa. Right. Now I'm wagging the finger at everybody that's watching this. If you say that we do not have good options in South Africa, you haven't been concentrating. We're heading towards a general election where we have got some great options for South Africa and some great talent out there, professional people that are prepared to go out there and do the work of running the country in the best interests of South African citizens. You heard it first on State of the Nation. I hope you subscribe to the channel. I hope you support Pace Car Rental. And then most importantly, I'd like to thank Songezo Zivi for joining us. It was really great to have you here. Gravitas, well done. And good luck for the elections. We'll catch up with you quite soon after that. Thank you so much for joining us today. And Mike, thank you very much for, for this segment of your, of your work. Because I think South Africans often listen to rhetoric and, and, and the like from us. They never get to, to hear the full context and the story. And that you are doing this for all the political parties is really important work for for the growth and depth of our democracy. So thank you very much to you. Thank you to everybody. And we'll see you the next time on the State of the Nation. <laughs>